Hi everyone, I'm Trish Triampho Sullivan and welcome to my lecture on photography. So I want you to imagine a world without photography, just for a minute. Take a minute and think about it. What would we be missing? Quite a lot, right? Pretty much everything we know comes from photographs. Have you ever been to the moon? No? but we know what it looks like, right? From photographs. How about the bottom of the ocean? Any scuba divers out there? Maybe not, but we know what it looks like because of photographs. We know these things, we know these places, we know exotic animals um, because of photographs. It's a big deal. And so what would we be missing uh, if, we were, if we were not to have photography? I'm going to darken this up a little bit so you can see the screen behind me. I think of photography as being probably one of this, probably the most single life-altering um, changes, inventions that happened in our world, period. Because everything that we have, our, our whole culture right now, is built around, you got it, photography. So what would we be missing? Think about it. What would we be missing? Now, most of you are too young to remember, um, but how about computers as we know it, as we know them today, and even the internet as we know it? Um, what did computers look like before photographs? Well, it was pretty boring. Um, it was a black screen, usually with green lettering. Um, our big computer game, wait for it, Pong, right? Pretty slow ball would go bouncing. Around the screen, about at that pace. Um, so. It was kind of a, a ping pong game. And at that time it was cutting edge stuff. So that was, com those, that was computers before photographs and before the internet um, as we know it. What else would we be missing? Think about it. Video, movies, TV. How about cell phones as we know them today? Most of the technology we have depends on or utilizes or directly results from photography. It's almost impossible to imagine a world without it. So photography is important in so many ways. Our lives would be incredibly different without it. And it is what I consider to be the single most important and life altering inventions of the 19th century, and, and also up to present, I think. Um, now, I'd like to share with you the history of photography. In fact, it's my favorite lecture. So we're going to begin with a British guy um, by the name of William Henry Fox Talbot. Right? He was an, an inventor and always had something going on. Um, he wanted, as did many others, to find a way to fix an image permanently. Um, and he discovered it, but he wasn't happy with his invention. He kind of kept going back and tinkering with it. He, he was, he did, he had a lot, did a lot of other things. And so this was something that he just, he wasn't, he didn't feel it was quite done yet. Um, then suddenly in 1839, up comes this guy, uh, Daguerre. And he addressed the Academy of Arts and Sciences in France and presented a paper. Um, he claimed to have invented photography. In fact, he called it a heliograph. Let's see if I have this slide in the right order. So we had two different processes at this time. We had William Henry Fox Talbot, a British guy, and we had Daguerre, a French guy, claiming to have invented photography. William Henry Fox Talbot um, had named his... Uh, his process, a calotype, and um, it came from the Greek kalos for beautiful and typos 
uh, for impression. So beautiful impression. Um, now Daguerre named his process a heliograph. And it was uh, Helios for sun and Graphos for drawing. So he is called his sun drawing. Um, so you might imagine Fox Talbot was pretty pissed off. He, he figured he invented photography. Um, and, uh, and the truth is, however, that Daguerre um, was not the actual inventor of the process. No. It was another guy by the name of Neps, and it's spelled N-E-I-P-C-E, -E, but it's pronounced Neps. It was a French guy. He had taken Daguerre on as an apprentice, kind of an apprentice partner, and Daguerre made sure that everything was documented. So when Neps died in 1833, um, Daguerre continued with the research and continued with the process, um, and his process became known eventually, as the daguerreotype. Um, and it was wildly popular. All over the world, studios sprang up like weeds. All over the place, people wanted a daguerreotype. So they, the demand was there, and they met the demand. Now, um, but Fox Talbot kind of had an ace up his sleeve. Um, his process, unlike the daguerreotype, his process was reproducible. Um, so you could make more than one image from his process. Now, the problem with Daguerre's process um, and really Nepp's process, because it wasn't, it wasn't really Daguerre's completely, but he took credit for it. He was one of those kind of guys, you know, take credit for someone else's work. Um, so his process, the Daguerreotype, um, what he called the heliograph, it was a one-of-a-kind process. You could not make copies. If you wanted a bunch of wallet-sized photos to give to your friends, you'd need to take a separate image for each one. Nevertheless, daguerreotype studios sprang up all over the world as everyone had to have this latest rage. There was a catch. Oh, and before I forget, I want to say... Um, this is a really important piece about the, uh, the William Henry Fox Talbot. He um, produced or, or wrote the very first, published the very first book illustrated with photographs. It was called The Pencil of Nature. And he could do that because his process, the calotype, was reproducible. He was able to reproduce images. So that's one of the images. He mostly had the pencil of nature, right? Mostly it was plants. So he was showing photographs of plants. Um, and this was kind of a big deal. This was published in 1844, so not too long um, after Daguerre had announced. Uh, William Henry Fox Talbot published a book illustrated with photographs, the very first book to be illustrated with photographs. So that's kind of exciting stuff. So let's talk about... Uh, uh, Daguerre here. So never um, the exposure time for these photographs was really long. Um, in fact, as long as 20 minutes. So that was kind of that was kind of difficult to deal with. How long do you think Nepp's first photograph, first exposure was? And uh, this is a, a image of what is believed to be the first photograph, circa. 1826, so quite a few years before Daguerre announced the invention of photography. So they had worked on it quite a bit more after that. So how long do you think this first exposure was? Remember, when it's announced, the exposure time is about 20 minutes. What do you think? Two hours? More. Six hours? More. 12 hours? A little bit less. So that the actual exposure time for the, this first photograph was eight hours. So that's a pretty long exposure. So when they get the exposure time down to about 20 minutes is when it's released to the public. Um, they finally got it down to, um, whoops, to about two minutes. But that's still a long time to sit still. So let's look really quickly at the processes. So here is... 
the process for the calotype, which is the closest to what we're doing today um, as far as regular photography. You've got a negative, right? And the negative is used to create a positive image. And so we are familiar with negatives and positives. And that is the photographic process pretty close to as we use it today. What uh, William Ho Fox Talbot's process, well, the reason it didn't make it, he wasn't happy with it, is it was a little blurry because his negative was made out of paper. So even though it was thin paper, it was still paper and it wasn't as sharp as the daguerreotype. The daguerreotype was super sharp. In fact, you could look at a magnifying glass at one of the images and you could see the, the actually the pores in people's skin. That's how incredibly detailed the daguerreotype was. And one of the reasons people wanted it, but the process was a little onerous. It was difficult. There were a lot of steps, um, and just like uh, William Fox, William Henry Fox Talbot's, um, you did have to have a studio. You couldn't just do it out in the open. You couldn't just take your camera with you somewhere and take a photograph. It was a whole lot of work and pretty difficult work. Um, so, so we have this process that takes a long time, and by the time we get out to the studios, um, they finally, you know, they finally have it down to around a two-minute exposure time, and that's still a long time to sit still. When you look at old photos, the subject often looks a little crazed, and it's not because great grandpa Joe was a raving maniac, okay? It's because he had to keep his eyes open and stay still for two minutes. Try it. It's really difficult. So the photo nerds came up with a, with a solution to that. Um, and here's an image of a, a daguerreotype studio that you would have seen pretty much everywhere. And if you look at it closely, you'll be able to see that uh, we have some people. Here's the photographer. Here's the guy sitting down. And he's in a special chair. If you see the people on the edge, notice that they're actually holding magnifying glasses looking at the images that they just got. So they're pretty excited about the quality of it. Um, so the photo nerds basically came up with a solution to keep people sitting still. They invented um, a special chair, um, and it kind of reminded me of, say, uh, let's see, this, is, this isn't the exact chair, but it gives you an idea of what they did. It reminds me a little bit of a torture device um, or a, an electric chair. They had little screws. They had a brace for your head, and they had little screws that they would screw into your head or your neck to keep you, your head still. Um, and they had special things to kind of keep your arms and your legs still. And it was definitely a device of torture for most people. Um, but it got people to hold still for two minutes while they were doing the exposure for the photograph. So needless to say, <clears throat> this process was not really sustainable. Um, and uh, you can see there's a, a photograph of someone getting their photograph taken. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and next up was a man um, by the name of Hill who used to be a portrait painter, um, and Hill and his chemist friend, Adamson. Um, now remember, not everyone could be a photographer back then. It was very expensive, and a person would have to be literate, um, be able to read and write. Uh, they had to be educated, they had to know chemistry. Um, the process was dangerous with many toxic chemicals, so it wasn't an easy thing. So Hill arrives on the scene with some very important knowledge, how to pose a subject comfortably and naturally f to sit for a portrait because he was a portrait painter. Um, and so what did people do before they had photographs? How did they, how did they do a family portrait um, before photography? Um, well, they hired a portrait painter. Um, these painters would travel from town to town and Hill um, basically was, was worked in New England, so he was up on the, the northeast corner of the, of the United States, um, and they would provide this service, this, this service of documenting a family or a, or a loved one. Um, so if you wanted to give a picture to your sweetheart, and then these are some of the poses that, uh, that Adamson and Hill did um, at that time. Right. You can see they look much more natural than the real stiff ones that daguerreotype was, was doing at the time. 
So you can see people are posed fairly naturally. And they were used to doing that because, um, because Hill, being a portrait painter, understood how to get people to sit still for hours and hours while they had their portrait painted. So he had poses that people could comfortably sit in over a long period of time, right? So if you wanted to give some a portrait to your sweetheart, you would get a portrait painter to, port, to paint, say, a miniature portrait um, that, they could, that they could take with them. Um, this was an actual profession, right? It was drastically different than, say, a fine art painter that you might collect in museums or see in a museum. This was like, it's like art for everyday people, right? These were people that wanted a portrait of themselves or a loved one. Um, so Hill, who was a portrait painter, and Adamson, a chemist, change how people posed for photographs. Right? And here's an idea of a miniature portrait painter. And this, was, this is how it was done back then, really common. Um, so next up on the scene of something that's really important in photography, or a person, I should say, who's really important in photography, is a guy named Nadar. Okay, and Nadar, um, and it's just one name, right? He was like Cher or um, Prince, and or the artist formerly known as Prince or Madonna, right? They just he just went by one name, and um, he had this idea that he wanted to photograph a celebrity. Um, he, in fact, he's was the very first celebrity photographer. Um, nobody had done this before, so he contacts. Um, at the time, Sarah Barnhart is the most famous actress. She's a world-famous theater actress, and he wants to photograph her. So he contacts her and asks her if she will come to the studio, and he does finally convince her to come to the studio. But when she shows up, she is dressed in her theatrical costume. And if you've ever seen anyone in a theatrical costume and makeup, you know that the makeup is really thick and exaggerated. In fact, if you look at someone close up with theatrical makeup, they look a little bit clownish, right? There's a little bit like a clown. So, so he says, wait, I don't want to photograph you as your character you're playing in a, in a play. I want to photograph you, the person, the actress. And she says, why would you want to photograph me? I mean, it's all about my character. It's all about the play, the theater. And he's like, no, no, I want to photograph you. You are the important one. So he convinces her to take off this elaborate wig she had on. He convinces her to um, get rid of her elaborate costume, um, combs her hair out, and, and removes all her makeup, and wraps her up in like some curtains. And this is one of the photographs that was taken at that time, um, and has her pose. And he takes this photograph, and this guy is right on. He understands that the general public wants to have a photograph of a celebrity. And you know what? He was right on the money. He's the very first paparazzi guy. He sold a bunch of photographs and made bank on it. Um, and he was the very first person to do that. So he continued to photograph celebrities and sell images. And he did well with it. So that's kind of an exciting uh, turn, turn of events. Um, in photography.